Okay, so yes, once again, thank you for coming on to this webinar series on single head and marriage. And so um, it's a jam packed session today. Okay, so so I'm gonna try to focus and, and get things moving. Okay, and then at the end we try, you know, we're gonna have a uh, Q&A session. Okay, so we hope you enjoy it. So today is gonna talk about understanding the biblical view of singlehood. Okay, so. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of misconception about like, you know, if I'm single, does not mean I have to give a celibacy and, and all that stuff, right? So, and then the next one I'm going to talk about the biblical view of marriage, which is uh, the one, you know, uh, the one of the key part of today's session. And of, and the last one is actually preparation for the season of single and the role of husband and wife. I think uh, it's more application based on what we first talked about. Okay, so, oh, sorry about that. Right, so let's just talk about singlehood from the beginning. Okay, so singlehood is, you know, when you are still single, right? So, so basically, you know, I took this slide from my first webinar in the worldview, right? About the different life stages that we generally go through. So, you know, everybody's different. You know, I'm not saying that this, this must be the way. Everybody has different life stages that they go through. Okay, but I mean the order of it is the same, right? So singlehood to dating, courtship, marriage, and parenthood. So today we're just gonna talk about the part, you know, where before you are, you're still single, okay? Even to, technically it should be before your marriage, right? Before you're married, right? So so I'm gonna talk about some of the myth, okay? And then kind of, you know, look at the Bible and try to help us um, figure out what some of the truths that can help us grow even in this season. Okay, so first of all, singlehood or singleness, is not second best, okay? So, I mean, a lot of times you think that, oh, you know, marriage is number one and the second is No, no, that's not it, okay? So that's that's not myth number one, okay? So number two is that singleness, on the other hand, singleness is not spiritually better than marriage, okay? Some, you know, some people say that, oh, if I'm single, then, you know, spiritually I'm better because, you know, I can serve God more. No, okay? So 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 those are the two extremes, right? One is like, oh, you know, you're single, oh, there's something wrong with you. And then if you're, you know, and then the other person is like, if, you know, that I want to be single, stay single because, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm holier than those who are married couple. And that is not true because the Bible never point one over another, okay? So so that is where I want to be be absolutely clear. And I'm going to, going to go a quick rant, okay? So before I say that, God knows that the season we're in. So God knows that we're the season of singleness we're in. And God knows the struggles that you face. Like, so for me, like, when, when I look at my season of singlehood, okay, I, I just remember, like, whenever I go to my friend's wedding. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Before that, like, when I first go to my young uh, adult school, right, everybody was single, right? Then everybody getting attached, right, getting in a relationship. Then everybody getting married, right? So so I remember, like, sitting at uh, my our friends, my friends, uh, what, uh, the wedding banquet, right? And everybody had, this, you know, a couple and I'm by myself. You know, that's the time I feel like, I'm single, like I'm, I'm like, wow, I'm really, sing- I'm, I'm like lonely, right? And at the same time, like, you know, but I just want to let you know that like, those moments when you fail, don't think that God is punishing you by keeping your spouse from you, okay? Like, the best I can comfort you with is understanding that God's way is higher than ours. Like, you know, I may not understand, and then the season you're walking, you may, you may not even understand, but God's way is higher than us. And the rant I'm going to talk about is that, like one thing I don't, unfortunately, I find within the Christian circle is that we make fun of people who are single or we tease them or we tease people who are, are married but not kids, right? So for me, it's so painful because like, for example, right, if there's a single person in the in the fellowship and then there's a new person who comes, it's like, oh, hey, Bob, you know, this guy is single too. So why don't you connect, you know, this girl is single too. Why don't you connect with them? That this kind of teasing, I don't find it funny and I would, I don't, I don't do it to others because it's hurtful because you don't know what that person is going through during the season of uh, single, singleness or singlehood, right? So, so uh, that's, that's, sorry, that's my rant. And then another myth is that if I'm single, I have to give a celebrity. So I have to talk about this because some people say, oh, you know, you're single, therefore you have to give it. I don't think that's true. Why? Because this is the passage that what people will pick it from, 1 Corinthians 7, 7, okay? So uh, in today's uh uh, webinar, uh, if you have time, read First Corinthians 7 because it clear out a lot about marriage and like whether you're married, single, or whatnot, right? So in the beginning, the context of why Paul wrote this, right? That, you know, Paul was saying that, you know, I wish each of you has, has is like me, who are self-controlled, a celebrate, 
right? But then everyone has to give one skill, one skill has this, one skill has that, right? So people will think that, oh, because of this passage that Paul is saying that, you know, the gift of celebrity is good because, you know, he's good, right? He said, I wish all of you are like me, right? But the context of that is actually about, you know, it's about, uh, it's about marriage. It's actually about, it's about people in, in marriage not having sex with one another because they want to be like holier. And, 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 and Paul just going to lay out and say like, that's not the point, right? And Paul laying out that like, you know, people, if you're not married, but, you know, and then you continue to read, you see that, you know, Paul said, if you're single and, and, and it's better for you to get married than burn with passion, you know, like, you know, so, 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 so give a celebrity specifically, at least in this passage, I can see it's being single and not having a desire for sexual relationship because that's, what Paul is talking about in this this at least this portion of of First uh, Corinthians chapter seven. Okay, so that means that we can be in a season of singlehood where we don't have the gift of celibacy. Okay, so as I say, you know, um, sorry, as I say, like the key of us having a healthy relationship is us being rooted in Christ, and and that's also mean in the season of singlehood, and and some people may be long, some people may be short, and some people may be for life. And so I don't know, because I'm not God, I'm not in control of your life, God is. And so my previous sessions, I say, like, are you willing to surrender your relationship part to God, right? And I think if you're a disciple of Jesus, the answer is inevitably yes. It may be painful, it may be a struggle, right? So the real question is, are we willing to lay down our relationship part to Christ? You know, if you're looking, if you are longing to get in a relationship, but you're not able to find one, and then you're asking like, oh God, is this, you know, and you're struggling in those times, you know, it's having key is rooted in, 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 in Jesus Christ. So, so the good, the truth about singlehood is that this is probably the only season in your life where you can fully default yourself in seeking his kingdom, right? Now, I'm not saying, you know, once you're married, you cannot do anything or marriage is worse than singlehood. No, no like I said, right, singlehood is good, marriage is good. Those both are good things, right? But singlehood is a season where you can just really seek him because you're not your focus. You can focus on that alone. And so, my challenge is: Are you willing to go all out for Christ in a season of singlehood? Right? You know, you know. You will assume that you you'll think that you know. I'm talking about you know this whole webinar series of relationship. You'll think that oh, you know, in singlehood, this is my tips on how you get relationship and whatnot. But actually, my first for most concern concern is are you willing to put that aside and fully seek God you know I'm, I'm not saying you don't look at relationship permanently but you know put it not in your top priority maybe a second and you seek God first in your first priority right so 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 okay so Cliff what does that look like okay so now I don't have to give a celebrity okay and of course I'm now married right but I can tell you in my season of singlehood right, up to 30 years, you know, 31 year when I was in ability to when I got married. This is how I cherish my singlehood, right? You know, I, it's not like I figured this out. It's actually, I won't say by accident, but like, because I, I'm single, so I have a lot of time, right? So what did I do? I was a deacon at my church. I was leading university fellowship. I was an usher on Sunday. I was actually leading usher team. So I was like, you know, doing the coordination and stuff, right? I was a Bible tournament coach for the kids. So at my church, I did like Bible cruising for the kids. I was doing that. And then I was doing missions by visiting the poor in Toronto. And what else I was doing? Well, I was in triathlon. But well, that's my fun thing. Right? So that's my own thing that I like to do, right? So it's also my testimony, right? And, 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 and I also went to seminary. I, took, I was taking part-time courses. Plus, I was working, you know? So, so like... You know, I can tell you if I met like now I'm a figure about I can do this. I don't think I can do this. Good, this is crazy. You know, with, with me looking after like two, two, uh, two toddlers being full time. But because I was single, I can just go all out. You know, now I'm not telling you you need to go out and all burn out. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just healthy way of you know seeking the Lord and serving Him. And I think that is so wonderful. Like what a wonderful season to be in. You know, I I don't think we need to look at it as like oh I'm just sitting around waiting waiting for the person to come. I think instead of looking at that, we should flip it around and say, you know what, how I can seek God more in this season, right? And, and you know, and, and, and as we lay a relationship to the Lord, let Him be the one direct. Who knows, that maybe in one of, you know, ways you serve, God will direct you with someone who's like-minded, right? You know, like I said before, the triangle, that you, you should be seeking people who are as like-minded spiritually as you are, 
You know what? What's other places to go than that? Right? But I'm not. But but then I'm not saying like you know this is the only place, and you jump on this, you know, thinking that you'll find someone. But no, no, you come in with a heart of skin and serving the Lord. And from there, you know what? Where the Lord will bring trust in Him and let Him take charge. Okay. So this is what I have to say about singlehood, and and I hope it encourages you because you know this season could be long, this can be short. I don't know. I'm not in control, and I don't think you're in control either. Or let me put it this way: as a disciple of Jesus. We should let him be the one who's in control, right? Like, like Rachel, how did she, how did she came out of my life? It wasn't like, you know, I was, I did not create a blog just to like, you know, try to find a girl online. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, like she came through like, random search on Google. But you know what? Even if you are living maybe the rest of your life in a season of singlehood, right? Can we able to see this as a way to seek the Lord, right? Because Marriage is a temporary thing. I'll talk about it next, right? And what we invest into into God and His kingdom is permanent, okay? So now let's talk about marriage. All right, the other time? All right, 10 minutes. Okay. So, so marriage. Ah, okay. There's so much, there's many things to talk about marriage, but marriage is, da, 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 first of all, it's ordained by God. Right? It's God who designed marriage right from the get-go, right? Adam and Eve. Right from the beginning. It's so amazing that, you know, you think about all the things that we can talk about God and it's about marriage. And even the way God uses an analogy between him and his people in the Old Testament is for marriage. It's covenant. Right? Whenever they broke it, they say that you are like a wife who's another guy, adulterer who goes off, you know. And so it's ordained by God. It's created by God. Right? So next point is, it's between one man and one woman. Okay? Like, we live in an age where you can be anything, anything, but I just want to be clear, okay? It's between one man and one woman, okay? Next. It's temporarily. Temporary. Sorry, not temporary. Yeah, it's temporary. It's four ways works, I guess. Yeah, Matthew 22, 30, right? But Jesus said, in heaven, we're not married. So as much as we put a lot of emphasis on marriage, which, you know, we do, but at the same time, we realize that it's not temp- it's temporary, right? That's why I say, see, his kingdom, you invest in him, it's permanent. Yeah, so marriage is also to leave and to cleave, right? This is from Genesis 2, 2 4, right? Explaining how a man leaves his father and mother, united to his wife, and they become one flesh. I'm going to flesh this out a bit later, okay? So just keep that in mind, right? And I, as I said before, it's two families coming together, right? Not just you and that other person, okay? Now, we're going to talk a bit more about a uh, covenant, a secret covenant, okay? So, so now let's talk about Okay, yeah, okay, let's just jump with that. Okay, now covenant, we're gonna talk a lot of on it. I'm gonna spend like, you know, a minute or so on it, okay? So what's a covenant? Why it's not like a contract? So these days, legally, it's a contract, right? Wedding is a con, it's, no, marriage is a contract, right? But actually, it's a, we, we, as Christians, we say it's a covenant because it's based on the relationship. That's what a covenant is. It's between two people, or between uh, God and his people, or between God himself, right? It's, it's between someone with relationship with one another. Right. So, for example, what's the difference between a co- covenant and contract? Very easy. Contract is like this. Uh, I'm right now renting. We're renting where we stay. The landlord and we have a contract. We don't have a covenant. I don't know him. I don't care. He doesn't know me. He doesn't care. But there's a contract. So something that he agree and agree. We have no relationship with one another. Right. So that is the that's the difference. Okay. So it's rooted in love. That's one of the key part of um of a covenant. It's rooted in love. Okay. And so, and um, as faithfulness is the key. It's being faithful to the covenant that we have made, right? And I mentioned it's between God and his people. You can see example, Exodus 1920. Now, between two people, David and Jonathan have made a covenant in 1 Samuel 18.3, right? And of course, there's one more between God himself in Genesis 15, right? When Abraham sacrificed animals, part of ways and stuff. So, 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 you know, so covenant is throughout the Bible, Right, and so so marriage is also a covenant, and the way I'm gonna look at marriage is looking at the I'm gonna look at it from a from the wedding vow because we're gonna see a covenant has agreements right, have like you know you do this I do this what are the agreements what are the conditions that make this covenant work right it's almost like a contract but there's a lot of relationship love right faithfulness all right let's do it all right so like on your wedding day if you do get married like this is what most likely you say okay I Cliff take you sorry and is the other person right take you Sorry, it's a bit small, <laughs> but I take you, right, uh, Weija, to be my wife, to have and to be whole from this day forward, for, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health, till 
death, to love and to cherish, to death to us part. According to God's holy law, in the presence of God, I make this vow, right? This is about the only time in your life you make a vow. Interesting, right? So let's, let's dig deep into that. I mean, there's a bit more, I mean, there's some variation. I take this right off Wikipedia, right? So, but that's, you know, so let's look at what the conditions, right? First of all, one, that there's, there's a condition, right? The condition is that is we love each other to death to a death as to death as do a part, right? So basically, the marriage stays together as long as both parties are alive, right? The marriage can only start when one party, you know, see Jesus, right? So that that's very important, right? So so no one can say, oh, I don't feel like it, and then go off. There's no such thing because of this vow that we made. It's serious, you know. And it's in the presence of God, right? That's that's a, uh, for for better or for worse. Right? I go for that worse, right? We don't we don't worry when it's better, when it's worse. That is the hard time, right? Like the, this vow is actually saying that for better or for worse, no matter what happens, right? And notice this, right? This vow, right? The condition is not based on the other person's response. The condition is that I declare my love for you. I stay honored to this wedding vow until either one of us passed away. But there's no condition to say that I'll stay here until if you don't, I'll, I'll go if you don't love me. You know, I'll stay here if, as long as you love me. There's no of that. But in today's culture, what do you say, right? I only love you if you love me. If you don't love me, we're out, right? We're gonna look for someone else, right? Hmm. So this is serious stuff, yeah. And then the, the other thing is, you're declaring this not before, just before people. You're declaring it before God, you know? The only time in the, if you look at it, the only time a vow has ever made, be made, taken place is in like the Old Testament. And and it wasn't made it wisely. It was a wedding vow, but like, it's just so serious that it has to be kept. And if, especially when it's made before God. You know, of course, when Jesus say, right? Yes, when you ask, you'll let me know too. <coughs> so, so, sorry. So that, those are the conditions that, you know, sometimes in this culture, we don't talk about it. But we just think it's lovey dovey. We like the, you know, the dress, you know, you know, coming in with the what with the kids, you know, throwing flat pedals and the in the in the in the in the, in the, 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 the little boy were holding a ring and all that stuff. You know, we, we love that we love those things. We love, you know, the banquet, we love the honeymoon, we love the stories, we love the photos, right? You know, all those things we, we talk about. But this for me, like, this is what makes a marriage a marriage. This is the key. And, and this is, for me, it's super serious, right? You're making a declaration before God. Like, I don't even care about before men, before God, right? So that means that we have to keep our words to it. Now, so, so, so what the, like, how, okay, so what's so serious about this, right? How everything changes. Now, this is before marriage. It's if it's before marriage, if, some, if you don't find something seriously wrong about the other person, like if you talk to you like within the church or pastors for people for help, a huge possibility is that you guys can break away, right? You guys can break away. Why? Because you guys are not in a the marriage. There's no agreement to stay together, right? Very different after marriage. If you're after marriage and something seriously happened, there's, there's, like, there's no such thing as saying, I, I wouldn't say most churches would say, oh, you should divorce their person. Why? Because the focus of our message, focus of being a Christian, follower of Jesus is reconciliation, right? It's reconcile back to God, reconcile back to the other. Where if you read First Corinthians seven, it's all about talk about its reconciliation. It's talk about that if someone, you know, if your unbeliever wife or spouse leave you, right, you, you know, you should not, you should not go, you know, you should not, you know, you know, like just stay and whatever, you know, stay where you are and so. So it's talk about reconciling, right? It's always talk about reconciling. So that's how serious about this um, marriage thing is, right? And and so, uh, okay, let's continue more. Okay, so. Like here's his here's my take on it. This actually I've only found out this last night. And I felt like God spoke to me. Like whenever some someone I know close to me get married, I'll send them this first. But this verse is great. Dear Chopin Hopper said, it's not it's not your love that sustains the marriage. But from now on, the marriage sustains your love, right? When you read this, my interpretation is that marriage equals commitment. From now on, it's not my love that sustains the marriage, the commitment. It's my commitment that sustains love. Wow, you know, today's, right? When we say what it means is that I commit, therefore I love. Before it's I love, therefore I commit, right? I love Raja, therefore I marry her. After marriage is I'm sticking with Raja, I'm committed to stick with Raja, therefore I love her. 
oh, so even when times when we don't feel like loving each other, the commitment comes. But actually, I realized this is not what he's talking about. He wasn't talking about my commitment, right? So, so okay, the next passage is super long. I'm sorry, but you know me, I like long passages, okay? So, so I uh, last night I actually find out this is from um wedding sermon that dear church preached or talked about 1943. So this this is during you gotta understand this is during World War II. He's a German. He's in Germany, okay? They are probably on the verge of losing the war, okay? So, I mean, and he's against the Nazis. So there's huge persecution. That is the context of what he's talking, the, the message is talking about. It's so crazy that he can still say that, like, you know, marriage is happy, it's for joy and whatnot. But anyway, so 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 this is what <laughs> sorry, it's super long. So let me let me read it a bit, right? So so uh, let me read it from beginning to the end, okay? And then, and now I'll just kind of pull out some of my points. In your love, you see only your two selves in the world, but in marriages, you are a link in the chain of generations, which God caused us to come and to pass away to his glory and calls into his kingdom. In your love, you see only the heaven of your own happiness, but in marriage, you are placed as a post of responsibility towards the world and mankind. Your love is your own private possession, but marriage is more than something personal. It is a status, an office, just as it is the crown and not merely the will to rule that makes the king. So it is marriage, and not merely your love for each other, that joins you together in the sight of God and man. As you first gave the ring to one another, and have now received it a second time from the hand of the pastor, so love comes from you, but marriage comes from above, from God. As high as God is above men, so high are the sanctity, the rights, and the promise of marriage above the sanctity, the rights, and the promise of love. It's not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage sustains the love. So where was I wrong? My wrong is that I thought the commitment comes from me, but he is saying the commitment comes from God. That's crazy, right? It's a commitment that comes from God that sustains the marriage, not even me that sustains the love, Right? That for me, it's like, wow, that is so mind-blowing, right? Like when he talk about like, you know, if you want to rule, if you know crime, forget it. You're not going to be a king or rule, right? Like for, the question is, who gave, who gave the authority for that person to wear the crime? It's God, right? So, wow. So my, here's my point. If I had to take away from anything else, if you know, if, if you're considered married, going to get married, already married, it's a commitment, oh, I mean, not married, it's a commitment of God that sustains our marriage. You know, forget about how much I love Raja. Forget about how much community I am. How I saw everything in Canada and come to Singapore. Forget about that. None of that matters, even when we compare to the commitment of God. Why? Because my commitment will fail. I'm a man. I will fail. Do you think there are times when Raja loves me less? Of course, especially when I sleep snow at night. All right. Okay, good. Aaron laughs. So good. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, Aaron. So, right? Of course. There are times when we will fail because we are men, we are women. We are, you know, even though we are, it's true. We are like, you know, we're sanctified, we're, we're saints and whatnot. But we still, there's still sinful nature in me. And then when the, when that commitment fails, when I my commitment fails, when my love fails, where do I draw strength from? Where do you draw strength from? Right, you just call it off, just like anybody else. I I don't really care. Like you know, people say like this statistic. Like, oh, you know, like. You know, Christians within the church have the same divorce rate as the rest of the world. For me, it doesn't matter. Because for me, it's the only marriage that matters is the one I am in. <sighs> wow, that's hard. That's, that is hard. That is the only thing that matters. I don't even care what the world is. I don't even care what the statistics say. Because when I look at this, I realize that it's the commitment of God to sustain my marriage. And when I, when my commitment is short, when my emotional is short, I lean on that. That is where we draw our strength from. Okay. Sorry for the preaching. So, so my next question, right? Your next question would be, how committed is God? That would be the second question I want to ask. How committed is God? Hmm. Very honest. Interesting. Ephesians chapter 5, right? Just as Christ loved the church, he gave himself up for her. How is committed? Jesus died on the cross. That's how committed he is, right? And, and you know, five, first, you know, chapter 5, verse 31, 32, right? The mystery to become one. And Paul is not talking about marriage. He's talking about Christ and the church. That is the mystery. That is the profound mystery. How committed is Christ? He already shown that it's on the cross. 
Wow, that's crazy, right? I, I bet you when you talk about marriage, you never talk about the props. I never thought about it. <laughs> right? But, you know, yet yeah, that is what Dietrich was pointing to. Something that even beyond, like, I was so blown away last night. I was telling Wager, I was like, so blown away. I never thought about it like that. Now, okay, let me talk about the role of husband and wife, okay? We're making good timing here. So if you, okay, if you're going to talk about husband and wife, okay, hu you know, husband and wife, primarily it's fine in Ephesians 5, right? 5, 30, 21 to 33. You know, I'm sure most of you have read it, right? Okay, so let me just break it down a bit, okay? So, okay, wife, submit to your husband. Okay, I'm going to talk about that, yeah, okay? So, so if, if you, if, if some of you are upset that I'm using the word submit, okay? Don't be... I explain what it means by submitting, okay? It's, you know, it's not being a slave, it's not any of that, okay? So, so it's submit, you know, not the way the world, this world sees it, okay? Respect your husband, right? Very good, right? Oh, sorry, I, I don't have a passage, but, uh, you know, God said, right, I will make Adam and helper, right? So, so, sorry, so, so the wife is also the husband's helper, okay? Now, if you are in Singapore, the word helper sounds pretty bad, right? <laughs> right? It's not, like, if, if I talk about this to a North American audience, you know, they don't know what a helper is. They just, okay, they still think pretty bad, right? You know, but here in Singapore, the context is, you know, helper is a helper. Okay, so, so keep that in mind, okay? And, you know, Proverbs 31, right? You know, these are probably some of the messages you talk about when you talk about why, what the roles of why, do this of why, okay? So I'm not gonna I'm gonna point one or two points. I'm gonna talk about post I'm not gonna talk about post thirty one. I don't have time. But if you have time to read it, please read it through. Please note it's not like you know, it's not a checklist, right? It's just the character of the wife, okay? Just keep that in mind. It's not a checklist. So don't feel like, oh I can not meet into that. Okay, no. Okay. So the second one is husband, head of the household, okay? So let me let me I pause for a minute, okay? Especially, I'm gonna talk to this, especially the guys, okay? But the guys who are listening, right? This means you, myself included, right? As a head of a household, that means that we have to lead, okay? That means that if you're not dating or you're still single or you're looking for something, you have to take the initiative to ask the girl out and you'll be willing to declare how you feel about her, right? Don't play the friends, be a friend thing just to get connected to a girl. Take the initiative. We have to take the initiative. We have to even have a chance for them to face rejection. Right? Because this is how you learn to grow to become a head of a household. Right? You don't become a head of a household by not taking initiative or leading. Right? And that's how you lead. You first is leading yourself. Right? Okay? This part of growing up, being a husband and a leader. All right, next. Love his wife. Okay. You know, wash her clean. Oh, like this is something that I never really thought too much about. Like this is what uh, Paul said, right? You do wash her clean with, with the word, of course. And then <laughs> As much as people say, oh, Proverbs 31 so, so, so bad, you know, for the guys, we'll, you know, the joke is that, like, it's actually for, <laughs> for the men, it's Proverbs 1 to 30. So, which, in a way, I say agree, doesn't agree. Okay, so, so that's, that's sort of a joke. Okay, so, so now, let me talk about, oh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I'll talk about this first. Submission. Submission does not mean passive, passivity. Okay, submission does not mean being a slave. Okay, when, 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 um, when, uh, sorry, when Genesis 2, right? When God said, I'll make a helper for Adam, that word helper, right? When you take the Hebrew word, trans word right? It's actually the same word, um, how we describe, how, how the psalmist described God. Say, God is my helper, right? Okay, see, you, you understand what I'm saying? You understand, do you understand? Like, it's not a helper that's like, help me do the dishes, help me clean my car, help me do this, help me, you know, wash my underwear, help me. No, that's not what it is, okay? It's not like being at the head of the husband. That's why I say head of the household does not mean oppression. I do not tell Raja, you'll do this, you'll do this, you'll do this, you'll do this, and that's, I just sit and do nothing. No, that's that's not what it means, right? So submission does not mean passive, passivity. It's not mean that I just sit spiritually lazy and let my husband do all the thinking or whatnot. As a wife, your duty is to make sure that your husband is walking in Christ. That's hard because there are times when you have to tell your husband something that they do not want to listen to because there's sinful nature in them. Raja did it to me. That means I don't want to listen to. I want to hide it. I don't want to ignore it. I want to ignore it. But Raja is willing to say, you know what, Cliff? This situation, you did this, it's a sin. You've got to deal with it. Or we're going to deal with it together. That's hard. I mean, that's, that's not passivity, you know. And, and even between me and Wager, we had discussion about, like, you know, theological things. Even as simple things as, as um, 
what it means to help the poor or something like that. Maybe how to give and stuff. Like how much to give more. We we think about it, we talk about it, we discuss over it. We we are iron sharpening iron. That's what I want to talk about as as a couple. You're iron sharpening iron because the only person who knows you more than the, any anybody else is your spouse. Inside, outside, there's no way to hide once you're married. There's no way to like, oh, pretend I'm good Christian on Sunday and then Monday and Saturday I do all these things. Ah, it's not gonna happen. The truth is gonna come out, right? So now the other side, as head of the household, as I mentioned, it's not talk about oppression, okay? It's you know how like my question is how did God deal with us, as He's the head and we're the church, gentle and kind, meek, you know, He takes His time. Patient, right? He does not rough us around. He doesn't tell us. He doesn't order us, right? That's hard too. That's really hard. This is a lot easier for me to tell someone what to do than taking the time, right? And the emphasis is about washing her with the word, so that the key is helping the spouse to become、uh, spotless, right? Become holy, blameless. That's that's hard work. That takes a lot of gentle, patient work. You know, that's that's something that, you know, it takes leadership to do that. That's why I say, like, you take initiative from the beginning. If you like, for example, if you don't want to ask a girl out because and you like her, that's a possible problem because how are you gonna talk to your wife and how do you gonna wash her clean and take the initiative to do so? It's hard, right? Just as I say, right? Like when Rachel tell me that something I'm wrong in my character or certain things, I don't want to hear it. Do you think I will enjoy listening to it? Do you think it's easy for her to say? No, because I will get mad, or there's a chance I get mad, right? Vice versa, right? And so we gotta deal with it, and and we gotta learn how to sharpen one another, right? So for me, you know, sometimes I hear so one one more point. Sometimes I hear like, oh, you know, the hus the husband work and the woman stay home. Well, if you look at Proverbs thirty one, it didn't. The hus the wife also work, right? The wife is the one who. Do businesses sell land, trade and stuff? Wow, interesting. Mix stuff too, you know. Now, you know, I, I'm gonna take this from Tim Keller podcast a bit. You know, he said that at that time in that era, how the husband and wife work at the same time because otherwise they cannot survive. Right? These days, you know, it's possible for one person to work and another stay home. Right? But in those times, it's not possible because you know, you know, it's like you know, the agricultural, industrial, you know, industry and stuff. Right? You know, there's there's no way they can do that. Right now, you know, like this nine to five or、like、eight to six or whatever, going to office and we'll come back. It's probably not possible in those days. No one travels, anyways. Possible. So, anyways, so so I just want to keep keep just keep this um to to consider because we all have to grow in Christ, and the better we are at it, we can help each other grow. Okay. So let's go back to about this, right? The 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 God's design, right? You know, is um you know this is the slide I took from my first. Session and overview, right? When I talk about marriage, you know, you are the chain that you know link of chains of generations that God has caused to come and to pass away to His glory. Is that crazy? That our free will decide to love someone is actually God's purpose right from the get go. You know, for me, it's it's so amazing. You know, I don't find it con- contradicting. I just find it amazing. So let me just talk about this, like, you know. To become one, that thing. So a lot of times, like I said, right, we become like, like one.、Uh, sorry, like me and Wei Jia getting married, but actually it's two family coming together, right? Two family coming together, but yet we're not. We're but yet at the same time we become a unique family, right? So when when Wei Jia and I came come together as as a as married like in the marriage as as husband and wife, we are our own family. Okay, what does this mean, right? It means that as husband and wife. We okay. Um,、uh, primarily me leading, making the choice and decisions for me, Raja and our children. Okay. Now I'm not saying I make all the choices. I discuss with Raja. She discuss with me. We both make decisions, right? So for example, that this the choices we have made that are not the same way our our family ah、uh, the way that we have grown up. But、right? partly because my my both um our family before they're not Christians, so we decided that things we grew up. The certain things we will not tolerate, we will not do in our household because we are our own unique family, right? And so I know most of people I'm in this session、uh, at least right now live is is Singapore. How many people listen to? Is is Singaporean? So you have to consider how does that work? Because this is leave and cleave. That's what I'm talking about, you know. 
you know, I'm not still dependent on my parents or, you know, we're just still dependent on, on our parents, right? What does that mean to honor them, but yet able to say no to certain things because you are own family unit and you are the one who decide what is the right thing to do, right? Of course, in the context of following Jesus, in the context of following God, right? That's what I'm talking about, right? That's the context I'm talking about. I'm not like, you can do whatever you want. No, it doesn't, right? So you get to make the choices and you even have time to say no to them. So for, uh, uh, a good example is uh, when we first got married, um, we collected all our unbowed, so all our, our red, red pockets, packets. And then we, uh, you know, we decided to give it to, uh, to help the poor, right? So, I mean, the, the most practical thing is, oh, you should save some for yourself because it's for your own future, for, you know, for home, for your best, you know, for your starting a, a home together, right? So we do have pressure from both family to say that, hey, you know what? Why didn't you say? Right? So here's the here's the here's the you know here's the thing, right? We gotta need to, need to be able to discern, like, do you want to quit like is this leave and cleave? If I say no to my parents, am I dishonor them or am I creating my own family unit and honoring God for that? Right? So so we end up taking all the money and give it to, um, you know, one of the organizations in Cambodia to stop child sex trafficking, right? But yet, those would be the times when you had to make a decision. You know, I'm not saying if all the time, you know, I'm not here to like to tell you you're going to rebel against everything your parents tell you to do, but you need to know the discernment. You need to discern that are there are things that you guys together when you are married, what would that look like that is different than your previous family, right? And that means all the... Um, all the unhealthy life scripts that from the previous generation before, things that needs to change, will change because now you're own and you get a choice made to it. It's not like your parents, you know what, you know, they have, inf you know, I'm not saying you do not honor them, you honor them, but at the same time, you make your own choices. Okay, so husband, please lead in this case, okay? All right, oh, time is going pretty well. Okay, so, all right, so, I'm gonna have two more slides, you know, I'm about to take away and, and we'll call it a day and then we got some QA. Okay. So okay, so so for singlehood, like if you're in a season of that and there's like nobody available or nobody you know you have interested in, first, you know, what 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 should you do, right? These are practical steps. What should you do? Well, first of all, focus on yourself. Like find out things that recharge you. For me at that time, it was triathlon. Like I would train, <laughs> I would go, like there were days when I would like used to like train in the morning for like two hours before I went to church on Sunday morning. It's crazy because of what I'm single, I can do whatever I want, right? So, and, and so figure out what is, what is a life, uh, what is a structure or routine that works well for you, right? And, and, and know that well. And second of all, is which is probably more important, is focus on Jesus. You know, don't think that you're the only one who struggled this. Or don't think that Jesus doesn't understand. Jesus understands. He's single his whole life on earth. And that's very rare for a uh, Jewish man. Like the, the his historical part in this in, in his culture, as a Jewish man to stay single above twenty, you know some rabbis him call that sin. Like it's crazy. Like but Jesus stays single his whole life whilst on earth, right? He he knows how you feel. So please focus and 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 and, and dig deep into him and seek him, right? The third point is being part of a strong Christian community that you can count on. Right? I said that a number of times. Whether you're dating, whether you know, it's true because. You need to have a community that you can lean on to fellowship with and be connect with, you know, especially when times you feel lonely, right? Have two, one or two close, personal, mature Christians that will walk alongside with you. And, and I talked to one of my friends who got married a lot later, like a female who, who waited for like almost, almost 30 years or something like that. And, and she told me this, she said, don't get like aunties who like to meddle in other business, like get people who really care about you Right. Don't just come and give you some two word, two two free bit of advice and walk away. That kind of don't really you know really care genuinely care about you about your growth about your walk in Christ, right? And and like I say, fourth point, give yourself fully to the Lord. Like this is the only time you can like you know pursue God with all your heart and you know like first of a what first of a better flock together, but that first of the same better flock together. Yeah, that's it. Right, do missions. I mean. When COVID stops, right? Or even do local missions, Bible school, serve. Like just on time go fully. And it's such a privilege. It's a privilege because you have the time to do so. Right? And um I, I read this from from a book from um Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's talked about relationship day by day. So he the, like one of the person is a single 
single person. Now this is how she talk about it. She say, longing for marriage with arms open, not clutch, right? You're not just praying, waiting for God to say, send me the right one, but rather open, let God be the one in charge. Right, last point, prayer is the key. Sometimes, you know, what, like sometimes I, I talk about taking initiative, right? Pray first. If you don't have the peace, don't take initiative. Just wait. Right? Ask God to have the peace and ask others to pray alongside with you. So that's confirmation. Okay? So this is for singlehood. Next point, for marriage or preparation for marriage. I assume most people are here in this session are not married, okay? okay. So, so first of all, read books on marriage. I'm going to show some like two slides later, I'll put them on the, on the web, web page so that you have resources, right? Uh, find couples as mentors. Christian couples, Christian mature couples as mentors. I mean, that's key. That's really good. Yeah, that's, that will help a lot, right? You know, marriage preparation course, I assume most of you will know that before you get married. But even beforehand, you know, it's, those are serious topics to talk about and consider. Like, I would say, like, if, if you only take NPC before you get married, it's very late because by that time you discover something that oh you realize you both of you are not like really committed. It's so hard to break it up because there's so much emotional investment. Everybody's looking, everybody expecting, yourself expected, right? It's so hard to break it up. Right? I'm not saying you're gonna take MPC right from the beginning, but do consider it seriously, you know. And and if you if you're in a relationship and there's conflicts, look for patterns. You know, I've been well, Mary Jane and I've been married for. Eight years, and yeah, we have fought. <laughs> we have fought big. We have fought small, right? Sometimes my fault. Okay, hey, ninety-five percent is my fault. Five percent is her fault. Okay, you know. So, so, and there's a lot of misunderstanding, miscommunication. But yet, like after a while, I can, I notice the patterns. Like she will say something, that I'll say something. She say something, I say something. Then I will just say stop. Hey, do you notice this pattern in us? So, 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 so this pattern, right? The conflict is not really the conflict. It's what's underlying what's the conflict. Maybe there's a misunderstanding, misexpectation. Maybe my life script saying, you know what? She will never understand me, you know, or I'm, you know, like I always have the one I've seen in this house, whatever, right? That causes that, aggravate that conflict, you know? So conflicts are not necessarily a bad thing per se. I think conflicts can reveal things in areas in our life that are not, right you know if in and at the same time if you're in a relationship where there's no conflict that's a problem like you know like 99 percent, i would say that both of you are just avoiding conflict at all costs you know i don't talk about it you don't talk about it and that's not healthy at all okay now and and my fourth wait one two three four five five point fifth point learn to be independent you know especially if you have finished university you know and 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 i know it's hard for like you know, I, I live with my parents after I graduated, but yet I still pay them rent. You know, it's not a lot, but it's enough, right? It's learning to be independent, like learning to like do your chores, pay your bills, right? That's part of growing up and being responsible. Like that's very practical actually, you know? And, and I remember when I was doing triathlon, I used to buy my own grocery because, well, because I'm eating so much, I got to, and I want to buy my own food that I like to eat. Right, but I'm buying my own grocery. I'm building my. I'm doing my own. <laughs> I'm doing my own laundry. Well, I was, I, I didn't want to university, but but yeah, that's part of being growing up. That's part of life. Like, you know, I know it doesn't sound like wow, so exciting, but you gotta learn to be independent. Like, and 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 so and so you know, not to be rebellious against your parents, but learn to be independent, to be even be part of helping setting table or cooking or something like that, so that you learn. That's. I think, I think not just the skills that you learn, but the attitude that you learn in being mature, right? And of course, last point, prayer. Prayer is, is so important about marriage, about like, you know, is it the right one? Am I ready to get married and whatnot? Okay, so let me just wrap it up a bit. Singlehood is not better than marriage. Marriage is not, not so better than singlehood. But notice in both seasons, oh, in both seasons, not seasons, we need Christ to sustain us. Right? Christ is always rooted in every season. There's no like, oh, you know, yeah, Christ is even rooted in single seriousness in marriage. Either way, single it's house. Right? And so uh, here are some resources for marriage. I wish there's like specific resource for singlehood. I don't have anything I can find right now. So, so, oh, sorry. You know, like, like one more point I want to say is that if you have the gift, of, if you think you have the gift of celibacy, I think you should explore that. 
I mean, by I mean, talking to somebody who is, you know, a single and enjoying serving and growing and, and, and have a conversation. And I think, I think in our church, in church, we don't talk that much often. And we talk about it's like, you know, oh, it's, it's our duties to multiply, you know, and what and whatever. But yet, you know, singlehood is, is an important season. And, and I don't think it should be just be so negative and just be looking at just waiting for someone. All right, so let's talk about this couple of books. Uh, John Piper, uh, Momentary Marriage, right? That's very good. Meaning of Marriage by Tim McCarroll. He also has a devotion, but I, I read this one. This also very good. Like this, the third one is the one that I read. It's more for people who are married because it's about like, you know, into the relationship. And the last one is Love and Respect, right? You know, because in Ephesians it's like, husband, love your wife. Wife, respect your husband. Oh, hey, different. And, it, you know, when we first got married, that book really helped us a lot because it kind of gave me a different idea of how my wife thinks so differently, feels differently than I think. And mine is like, yeah, anyways. So that's about it for today. Yeah, thank you for coming on. If you have any questions, please feel free to type. You know, you can type to me privately and then we can, we can talk about it and discuss it.